you guys. Hope you had a great spring break. I uh, know we had uh, lots of people out and about for spring break and uh, teams that went to Mexico that I think got back today, a uh, team that went to Pittsburgh, and a lot of you guys were out and about and representing Jesus where you were at. And uh, so that's, you know, it's just exciting to have you back. Welcome. And, you know, thanks for making it upstairs tonight. We obviously are in a, you know, different spot. So thanks for figuring that out. It was awesome. Um, hey, listen, we've got a lot going on this week. It's a great week for New Life. Uh, this is the week of the fashion show. So if you haven't got a ticket, if you haven't done that, tonight's the night to buy one. Um, let me just say that uh, you can buy one not only for you, but maybe for a friend, someone who you think would be good, um, you know, who would really be into that cause and invite them to come out. Um, also, we could use some help. Uh, we need people who could be willing to sell tickets during the week, this week on the Oval and abroad, you know, in different areas. Um, if you can do that, see Andy afterward. Let me explain. It would be a huge deal if you could even donate an hour of your time this week to help sell tickets. Um, because we, we need to sell some. And uh, we've already raised over $1,500 for, uh, for the organizations that we're raising money for. And we're hoping to raise several thousand more. So it's going to be exciting. And I'm hoping that everyone will be praying for this every day this week. And uh, I hope that you have some free time to sell tickets. So I just want to let you know about that. And uh, you can see Andy about that. He's going to make an announcement at the end. But also, I'm um, real excited. The guys are going to have a retreat at the uh, mid-April mid point, and so we'll give you more details about that, so that's going to be really good, and uh, I'm just excited to see you guys again. So, hope you had a, a great break. Uh, mine was a long break. Uh, had a, a lot of time to think because my, my whole family was sick with the flu, so I was at home a lot, and I'm taking, you know, I was up late a lot, and I was thinking a lot, and I was thinking how, how surreal and weird it is that, you know, I get to be your pastor. You know, and this really kind of hit me a couple of weeks ago when I was coming home from a church service here. And I was driving up 315 North. And uh, if you guys have been on the outer belt, right where 315 hooks on to 270, here's what happens. 315 goes north, and then you go on to 270. And if you're going this way towards 23, which is where I go, you're going off to the right. And then what happens is 270 comes in this way, and the people on 315 usually try to get over. There's people trying to get over. And then once you get into the turn lane where you're going to head up to the clover leaf to go to either 23 south or 23 North, there's a cement divider that kind of runs like this, okay? And so I've driven this way a thousand times, guys. I mean, I've been coming down to campus for 10 years. I mean, it, I've driven this place a thousand times, and it was the same trip as every other trip. I'm driving along, and I'm listening to Randy Travis. And uh, I was thinking how... You know, you guys probably don't know who that is. I'm, and I love Randy Travis. He's one of my favorite country singers of all time. And, uh, he's this, and I was thinking, you probably only know Randy Travis as this guy. Yeah, that, that's for ancient. Once upon a time, that crazy, weird old country singer was this really fabulous, amazing country singer, one of the hottest singers in Nashville. And he was my favorite singer. Saw him in concert three times, took Tim. It was awesome. And I'm driving home. I'm on 315. I'm heading up there and, and I'm listening to Randy Travis. And I'm thinking, wow, this is weird because none of my students probably know any of his songs. It's just weird. So I'm, you know, I'm just kind of going along, minding my own business. And, and I get to where, you know, I'm in the cement divider is here. And so I'm in one lane. And then so there's one lane. And then here comes the, the clover leaf. Now the clover leaf, there's a car coming down, the, you know, this side getting on to go up to 270 and I have to get this way and I'm thinking, I think they're going faster than I am. So I kind of slow down to about 40 and I'm going to get in right behind them like I do all the time and I'm just kind of going to sneak in behind them and the car's going to get, and then, you know, I'll be up just on my way like I always do. Well, here's what happened. As I'm kind of getting over and uh, I, I look, the car's coming down, I kind of back off a little bit and in my rear view mirror, I see two lights coming at me flying. Yes. Did you guys hear the scream? That's how I was feeling inside. Listen, have you ever been on the freeway and you're driving the freeway and the cars are stopped in front of you and you start slowing down as fast as you can and you, you look in your mirror and there's someone coming right at you from behind? That's what's going on. Two lights flying at me and I'm thinking, I'm going to get nailed. And I've got nowhere to go. So here's what I did. Instinctively, I, I hit the brakes. And then I went... No. So I hit the gas as hard as I could, thinking, well, at least I'll be going forward when I get smashed. So I kind of drifted as far to the left as I could, right up to the cement wall, and I heard this awful sound behind me. And I saw lights going like this. I saw the car fly over this way, and then fly this way to avoid the car that was coming down the cloverleaf, and then up, flying. My heart is pounding. My adrenaline's kicking. My life is flying through my eyes. And Randy's just belting out tunes on my CD player. Like, I'm, sitting, I'm, I'm just freaked out. I tell you the story because I live my life by faith all the time. 
And by faith, I drive home, believing it's going to be the same uneventful ride home that I always have. Everyone here operates their lives by faith. Everyone. And in a collegiate community, faith is kind of looked down upon. I don't know if you've had a conversation with someone, and when they say, oh, you're a person of faith. Yeah, well, you know, we believe in things that are real. We, we don't, you know, faith, that's kind of the fairy tale stuff. You know, if you're in the science you know, field or you're going to science classes or, you know, sometimes they'll say, oh yeah, leave religion into its place. But in here, science, you know, we study things that are repeatable, you know. And it's kind of looked down upon that, that, that faith is this negative fairy tale type thing. But the reality is every person lives their life by faith. Everyone does. It's not a Christian thing. Everyone does. For example, when you go to a doctor and a doctor gives you some kind of diagnosis, by faith, you say, okay, what's the treatment? You have faith that the education system is going to produce what you want for your life. So you come here and you study hard and you do the work and you pay the bills and you, you know, because you believe that somehow by faith that you're going to have a better future for doing so. Everyone lives by faith. Caleb, a few weeks ago, uh, read this quote by Richard Dawkins. Richard Dawkins, a famous atheist, said this, that I cannot be sure that there is no God, but I live my life on the assumption that God is not there. That is a faith-based claim by an atheist. You see how it works? And we've been in a series talking about the heart of the Father and what it would look like in a community like this if the epicenter of, of us was the heart of the Father and what that would look like, and we've been studying the heart of the Father pretty closely, and the first time we looked at we saw that God is, our Father has a heart of love. And then we talked about justice and how God is a God of justice. But we also know this is true about God and that God has his heart set on us having faith in him. In Hebrews 11.6, it says this, that without faith, it is impossible to please God. It's impossible to please God. So the question then you have to ask yourself is this, what does it look like for me and you to have a heart of faith that pleases God? And if you've, if you've been a Christian your whole life, you need to ask yourself, okay, all right, well, what does this look like for me? What, what, what's my life supposed to look like to have this kind of faith? And if you're here and you lost a bet or something and you just, or you stumbled in thinking there was a class tonight and you should be asking yourself the same question. All right, well, I'm not sure I believe in the Bible. I'm not sure about this whole Christianity thing, but I'm kind of getting an idea that there's a God. What would it look like for you? You have to ask yourself to have a heart of faith that pleases God. And so that's what I want to look at tonight. And so Emily read this very obscure passage and we're going to look at that passage pretty closely because I think there's some keys in this passage that will help us understand what God actually wants from us when it comes to our faith. So if you have a Bible, open up to 1 Kings chapter 18. And let me kind of give you some background here. Um, Adam and Eve, Noah, Abraham, Moses. Moses brings, you know, all the Israelites up out of Egypt into the promised land. And then eventually there becomes a king, King David. He becomes the most famous king. He unites the people of Israel. And they have, that's their pinnacle moment is under King David. And then what happens is all the kings that succeed, or succeed you know, David are worse and worse and worse and worse and worse. And now we're talking generations down the road. There's a king called Ahab. Ahab is literally worse than any of the other kings. At this point, the nation is split in two, and Ahab marries a woman named Jezebel. Jezebel is not even an Israelite, and she worships foreign gods. And so for the first time, Ahab brings in someone and institutes idol worship as a form of, you know, religion to the Israelite people. And so for the first time, they're now worshiping plurality of gods, kind of much like it is today. And so they had Asherah, which was kind of a sexuality type God that they would worship. And then they had Baal or Baal, or I'm not really sure how to pronounce it. I've been arguing with people and they've been arguing with me like, we have no idea how to pronounce this thing, but I'm just going to say Baal because that's what I'm hearing. So nevertheless, this God was a weather God. And so it kind of protected them and their agriculture, their culture, you know, their livestock, everything. Um, and so here's what happens. There's a prophet named Elijah. Elijah is the most important of all the prophets of God. Literally, when Jesus showed up on the mountain, the transfiguration, and he showed up, and then Moses and Elijah showed up, because Moses represents the law of God, and Elijah represents the prophets God, or God's revelation through his word. These are the two most important ones. Elijah is the prophet at the time of King Ahab. 
The thing is though, Ahab hates Elijah and Jezebel's trying to kill Elijah and they've killed most of the prophets. And so here's what happens. And uh, let, me, let me just back up one more second. This moment happens where Elijah's heart is that somehow the people of Israel would, would stop being, you know, um, focused on other gods, that they would focus on the one true God, Yahweh, okay? And so there's a showdown on Mount Carmel, and what happens is Ahab comes out, and, the, and you know, they, all the prophets of Baal come out. Did I say that, Baal? Baal? Anyway, I'm going to mix it up all the time tonight. So nevertheless, the prophets come out, they go up on the mountainside, and uh, Elijah comes out and says, hey, let's build an altar, and they build an altar, and says, hey, well, you know, why don't you have your God come down and, you know, consume, you know, your, your altar with fire, and so they go hour after hour, after, nothing happens, and then finally, you know, Elijah's thing, you guys heard the story, he's got his little altar up there, and they dump water all over it, fire comes down from heaven, consumes both the altars, then, you know, they put the, the prophets of Baal to death, and the people of Israel shout, Yahweh's our God. Right after that, here's what happens. Verse 41, and Elijah said to Ahab, go and eat and drink, for there's a sound of heavy rain. This is significant. If you flip back to chapter 17, verse 1, here's what happened. Now, Elijah, the Tishbite from Tishbe in Gilead said to Ahab, as the Lord of God of Israel lives, whom I serve, there will be neither dew nor rain in the next few years except at my word. So God has working through Elijah and basically he's telling Ahab, not gonna be any rain. Now, why is this significant? Because they're worshiping a weather God. The God who's supposed to be the God of rain and thunder. The God who's supposed to make sure the crops grow and make sure that they have food to feed their families and feed their livestock. And now it's been a couple years and nothing's happened. No dew, no rain, no nothing. The people are dying. Livestock is dying. Ahab and Jezebel are trying to kill Elijah if they can find him. And now all of a sudden it's going to rain. Here's the thing. Before we move on, you might think to yourself, how ignorant the people of that time were, Right? They would worship some created thing to depend on their weather, right? And we would never do anything like that. We would never pick something created to kind of predict our weather. I, I have some friends that are pretty ticked at the groundhog right now, by the way. Um, I think it just shows how, how weak we all are. I mean, we're all broken. These people were worshiping a false god for their livelihood. And this brings me to the point I want to get to about our faith. The next thing that happens, verse 42, so Ahab went off to eat and drink, but Elijah climbed on the top of Carmel, bent down to the ground, and put his face between his knees. Here's the thing. Our faith must be established with humility. In order to have the kind of faith that pleases the heart of God, our faith must be established with humility. Here's a man, Elijah, who's just done something amazing. God has used him in an amazing way, had this incredible victory. The prophets of Baal are now killed. The people are now starting to say, the Lord our God, Yahweh, he's the one. And he goes straight up the mountain and he knows it's going to rain because God already told him when, you're, you, know, when you say it, it's, it's going to happen. And instead he bows down with his face down, his head between his knees in a posture of prayer and complete humility. The question you have to ask is Why? Why is a guy like Elijah with this much, we'll say, power to lead the people of God praying in this posture? Let, let me just say, I, I heard a, a quote from Tim Keller. He's a pastor out in New York City about what humility is. Humility is not thinking less of yourself, but thinking of yourself less. Not thinking less of yourself, but thinking of yourself less. Listen, Sometimes we see a person who's got incredible skill, but they, they say something like, oh, I'm really not that good, or I'm really, you know, people who talk down about themselves, really, that's not humility. We might think that's humility, but it's really not. It's just low self-esteem. It's when someone is actually thinking about themselves so much that they, they don't like how they perform or who they are in light of other people's comparisons or other people's judgments on their life, and so they kind of look down on themselves. That really is not humility. Humility is when you think of yourself less, because you're concerned about other people. You're concerned about what God wants. That's a posture of humility. You're more concerned about others. Here's the posture that he's praying in. He's praying in a way, recognizing God for who he is. He's not praying, all right, God, you better make my word right. He's praying, God, make your name known. God, do your thing. I mean, this is Elijah's heart, one of humility. And the thing I love about Scripture is that scripture 
is so powerful. I don't know how often you read your Bible. I don't, you know, I don't, I'm not here to judge you about your reading plan or whatever, but I can tell you something. Sometimes you come across a verse in scripture that you just know is so true, and yet it kind of cuts you inside at the same time. You ever come across a verse like that? There's a verse in James 4, 6 that says this. God opposes the proud, but he gives grace to the humble. And that's a quote from Proverbs. But God opposes the proud and gives grace to the humble. Here's the point why I think they're connected. You see, humility is not thinking of yourself. It's thinking of others. And, pe and everyone knows it's true. That we all think, everyone thinks this. Even if you're not a Christian, you think this. Well, if God had just answered this dot, 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 I would have more faith in him. And I've sat with many people over the years, and I'm talking many, whether the college students or beyond, many people who will say something like this. Well, if God would just do this, then I would believe him. And I'd say, well, what do you mean? Do you want like God to like line up the clouds and say, hey, I'm God. Do you, I mean, would that help? Yeah, that would help. What if God like cut down through the ceiling, jumped down on the table and danced like a chicken? Would that help you? He goes, yeah, God did that. Yeah, I'd believe in him. And I, say, I always say, look, that's not gonna happen. Because what you want is for God to be a God that serves you. That, in essence, is pride. You want a God who's smaller than you are. And people usually say, oh, that's not true. I'm like, yeah, it is true. It's what you want. This is the thing. Humility is thinking of who God is, thinking of others, and the posture of our faith needs to be one of humility, which says, all right, God, you be who you are. I'm going to respond to you. I, um, I have a, a friend who, who, I've shared this story before, but it's been a while, um, a friend who used to come here to New Life. And I, I really, just my heart goes out to this guy. I love him to death. Um, but he struggled a lot. But his faith was based on pride. Based on his sense of self. You know, he would follow God if dot, dot, dot. And if God seemed to be answering his prayers or answering something or, you know, if he thought he could get something from God, he wanted to follow God. But when God didn't answer his prayers the way he wanted, he kind of fell away. And that's just how it went for like this, for years with this guy. And uh, one day he was, he was in my basement and we were talking and he was telling me, you know, I think I'm just going to move off to another city and, uh, you know, yada, yada, yada. And I said, well, how come? He goes, well, I just have nothing here. You know, I said, well, I said, I honestly think that if you move there, you're just going to be dragging the same problems you have down there. And he says, well, what am, you know, what am I going to do here? I said, well, what's the problem? He goes, well, I don't have a job. You know, I... You know, I'm gonna, my lease is coming up March 1st. This was like early February. And he goes, I said, so what you need is you, you need a new job and that way to take care of your lease on March 1st. Yeah. I said, well, what are your prospects? He goes, well, I've been applying at Ohio State, you know, the, at, the, at the university hospital since September and I've never gotten a call from anyone. I said, okay. I said, why don't we pray about it? He's like, all right. So I prayed. I said, God, uh, I'm just asking that you would give him a job that you'd have a job for him before March 1st. And God, if, if it's okay, we're asking that he would get a job at Ohio State University, the hospital. Amen. I mean, I was that. I didn't really expect much because, you know, I don't know. And so the next week, coincidentally, he got a call from Ohio State. Coincidentally, he got an interview. Coincidentally, he got hired. You know what his start date was? March 1st. i not kidding you. And I remember when I got the news, I'm like, this is you're, why are you showing off? Like, you're really good at being a God. And I'm, I'm just so excited. And my friend takes the job, works for a couple weeks, decides it's not for him, moves off to another city. To this day, doesn't follow God. Here's the thing. I think if your faith is based in pride, that it's all about you, you're never really going to see God. You just won't recognize him. But we, in order to have the kind of faith that pleases the heart of God, need to have a heart of humility and have that posture. Secondly is that we have to have faith that's marked by persistence. Um, persistence is basically this. It's, it's to continue steadfastly in course of action or purpose in spite of obstacles or discouragement. So it just doesn't give up, that kind of faith. And let's go back to our passage in verse 43. Here's what happens. So imagine Elijah climbs back up to the top of Mount Carmel and he's got a servant with him and he's telling Ahab, all right, go eat. You better get it, you know, get your belly full because it's going to rain. And he goes back up to the top. He's praying. He's got his head down. And he's praying. And uh, he says, go and look, verse 43, go and look toward the sea, he told his servant. And he went up and looked. Well, there's nothing there, he said. Seven times Elijah said, go back. 
So imagine just for a second, here's what happens. You know, Elijah's there, he's praying. The servant comes over and he says, uh, all right, go to the sea. Okay, he goes the first time. He comes back and says, there's, there's really nothing there. And then uh, he says, well, go again, you know. And he comes back a second time. And he comes back a third time. And, he comes back a and each time, he's going, uh, I need you to go back. And I, I just imagine the servant going, how many, how many times? And, and I start thinking as I'm reading this, how many times would have Elijah asked him to go? I don't know. Elijah had a persistent faith. He refused to give up. And we know that's the kind of uh, faith that, that Jesus talked about because he talked about the, the woman who had persistent prayer, who wouldn't give up. And, you know, we know this as a, as a dad. Listen, sometimes my kids wear me out. They just keep asking and asking and asking. That's the kind of faith he's actually asking from us. He wants us to have a persistent faith. The question is, why is it that we give up? Sometimes it's because we don't understand what God's doing. We don't understand the heart of our Father. Sometimes we just don't get it. Sometimes the answer is no, and we don't get that. Sometimes he's doing something different than we actually expect. Sometimes that you guys, you know, you see this with your own dads. You just don't understand what your dad is doing because you're too young or something like that. And so I, I had a friend who played a video for me that um, he's a dad. He's got three boys and he shared a video that I thought was important for us today that I think will give us an idea. Of sometimes you just don't understand what the father's up to. So we'll let, let's let you guys see this video. It's just kind of pay attention here. It's deep and spiritual. Are you ready for this? Yeah. Okay, as you can see, we have affixed uh, the string, the dental floss to this Scott's teeth. This is my friend Brian Fry, so the camera can see it. All right, so we've got that. And we've also affixed uh, the dental floss to the door right here. So uh, the soonest we push on it, Scott should lose his front tooth. Okay, so um, any, any last words you'd like to say to that tooth that has served you well for six years? It scares me. It scares you a little bit. Do you want to say goodbye to your tooth? You want to say goodbye? Bye. All right. Goodbye. Wave your tongue. Okay. So if you look in the camera right there and you'll smile real big one last time. Now open your mouth and smile real big and say bam. <laughs> um. <laughs> Where is it? Uh. You ever think you're going to do something a sermon and at the end you go, man, I probably shouldn't have done that. <laughs> Listen, in all seriousness, here's the thing. We give up for a lot of reasons. Sometimes we just don't understand what God is doing. Come on, stick with me. Can you imagine that though? Bam. Anyway. Listen, sometimes we give up because we just don't understand what God is doing. L let me say this real fast. Just, I'm serious with you now, okay? You might be thinking to yourself, Ed, you don't understand. I've been praying for this thing for a long time. Whatever your dot, dot, dot is. And you've been praying for it for a long time. I do understand. I don't know your circumstance, but I do understand what it's like to want to give up and not be persistent with God. Like, I've told you the story of my brother many times about my brother who was an alcoholic and gave his life to Christ. But when I started praying for him, it was seven years. It took seven years before he finally gave his life to the Lord. And he's been clean now for 13. But seven years is a long, long time. But I kept praying. And there were times I wanted to give up, but I kept praying. And eventually God acted, apart from anything that I could imagine. And God had a purpose for those seven years. I have another brother I'm still praying for, guys. And it seems like nothing's happening. Don't give up. I'm dead serious about this point. God wants a faith in us that's going to be persistent. And you might be having something in your life that you want to give up on. And what I'm asking you to do is to trust the word of God. Trust what he's saying about faith, that he wants us to have a persistent faith. Even if you don't understand what God's doing. Just as I kind of move on to kind of the next point, I just want to say this, that one of the reasons that we give up is just because we all have doubts. And it doesn't matter if you've been a Christian your whole life or you just became a Christian like last night. I want you to know that everyone has to deal with doubt. 
I have doubts. I understand that. I have a friend who, uh, who comes to my house on a regular basis, and uh, his name is Calvin. I've shared a little bit about Calvin in the past. Calvin is a Jehovah's Witness, and maybe that means nothing to you, but let me explain kind of what it means. He grew up in a church where, that teaches that Jesus is not God. This is a huge deal. And so he comes over to my house, and a lot of times we talk about parenting, and we talk about you know, religion, we talk about theology, we talk about Jesus. And I always bring up who Jesus is. And I communicate from what the Bible says about Jesus, that Jesus is more than an angel. You see, his church teaches that Jesus is just an angel. And I show how angels don't accept worship, but in the Bible, Jesus accepts worship. Jesus is actually given the power to judge the world. He's given the power to rise people from the dead. All through scripture, it talks about him as God. In fact, in John 1.1, 1, 1, there's a, a verse of scripture that says this. In our Bible, it says, in the beginning was the word, and the word was with God, and the word was God. John 1.1. 1, 1. And later on in the chapter, it says, and the word became flesh. Let me tell you what that means. When it's talking about the word becoming flesh, it's talking about Jesus. So you could translate it this way. John 1.1 1, 1 could say this. In the beginning was Jesus, and Jesus was with God, and Jesus was God. Now my friend Calvin, his church translates that Bible from the same Greek text, translates it like this. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was a God, little g. Adding that article in there, almost making it like Jesus is just some kind of smaller, lesser thing, and then they teach that he's just some angel. And I have shared with him over and over and over again, and I honestly doubt that he's ever going to budge. And he's going to literally never understand the importance of Jesus in his life. He has doubts that what I'm saying is true. Because if what I'm saying is true, everything he's done in his life, and he's in his 50s now, his whole life means it's been a lie. The people who have taught him, the people who he loves, this is all a lie. And he has doubts. Do you see how doubt is? Doubt stops us from having a persistent faith. So the question that we have to ask is, how do you overcome doubt? What has to happen? And that's what I want to get to this last point, and I think is, is really a big deal. All of us have to have a faith that recognizes where God is working. Faith is this, from Hebrews 11.1, 1, it says this, being sure of what we hope for and certain of what we do not see. Back to verse 44, here's what it says. After the seventh time, the servant reported, a cloud as small as a man's hand is rising from the sea. Now, I want you to imagine, seven times you've gone out. Seven times you've gone and come back, and the last time you're like, well, um, there's a cloud, Elijah, um, about the size of a man's hand. Let me give you a clip of what it looks like from the top of Mount Carmel on the seaside. Um, so imagine, you know, there's been a drought. There's been no clouds for years. And so you're up here on top of this mountain, and that's your view. There's no clouds in the sky, and you're looking out above the sea. And you come back and you're like, well, Elijah, there's a tiny, I don't know, about the size of a, I mean, a small dude. I mean, it's, I don't know. So here's what happens. So Elijah says, go and tell Ahab, hitch up your chariot and go down before the rain stops you. Meanwhile, the sky grew black with clouds, the winds rose, and a heavy rain came on, and Ahab rode off to Jezreel. The power of the Lord came upon Elijah, and tucking his cloak into his pelt, he ran ahead of Ahab all the way to Jezreel. So here's what happens. The man comes back, says, you know, the servant comes back and says, hey, there's a small cloud. As soon as he hears it, oh, small cloud, boom, now's the time, now's the time. Go, tell Ahab, get in the chariot, and then obviously the power of God comes on Elijah. The clouds come in, the rain happens, and then everyone sees the power of God. But Elijah recognized the movement of God before anyone else did. Why? Elijah was sure of what he hoped for and certain of what he could not see. He absolutely recognized where God was going to be moving. He was praying, and he knew and trusted and had faith. A posture of humility. He was persistent. And then he started to recognize. And that's the kind of faith you and I must have. And here's the truth. A lot of times we start out with a little step of faith towards God. Even sometimes we're in the right posture, one of humility. And then sometimes it gets tough. You know, God allows us to, he doesn't give us an answer right away and we start praying. But oftentimes, that's when we just close our eyes off and think, okay, God's not gonna move. And then we miss what God is doing. And let me tell you what I'm convinced God wants. God wants us to have faith in him and as he comes to us, he shows who he is, 
our faith grows and our worship grows. But not if we don't recognize it. Let me tell you, I have had many situations where I have prayed and I've just kind of blanked out. I had a situation recently where, where by the grace of God, I didn't blank out. We live in a neighborhood and I've shared about this couple before, but let me just share this story in case you didn't hear it before. There's this neighbor of mine named Casey. Casey lives right across the street. Casey's a couple years younger than I am, but he's kind of, you know, kind of moved in and his girlfriend lives there, Gina, and, you know, they live in this, you know, condo across the street and uh, a lot of times Casey's out on his porch. Casey's kind of a rough looking guy, you know. At the time he had this real long hair he used to pull back and his, he'd wear a bandana and he'd be out sitting on his porch smoking and he never really smiled and I'm like, you know, I'd see him and I'd, you know, he wouldn't really look at me so I'm kind of thinking, all right, we're never probably going to be friends, I guess. But I kept praying. I'm like, God, use Tammy and I in this neighborhood. Help us to share the gospel with our neighbors. That's our heart and we pray persistently on that. I pray persistently. I'm like, God, you help use us. Help us share the gospel with our neighbors. But then, you know, we had a community yard sale. Casey comes across with Gina to the yard sale, and I try to talk to him. I'm like, hey, how's it going? Nothing. It was as if he didn't even hear me. And I'm like, all right, crickets are going on. I mean, nothing, right? Well, then, you know, a couple months later, it's, um, you know, trick or treat. And so we take our girls over there to trick or treat over his house. And I'm like, hey, how's it going? Nothing. I'm like, man, I don't think. He likes me. I mean, I don't think we're ever going to be friends. And, um, but something really beautiful happened. You see, my wife is not just beautiful. She's very smart, too. At the time, she was working at Starbucks. She knows what we're praying for. In the mornings, Gina would come by Starbucks and order coffee. And when Tammy was working the drive through she's like, oh, it's on me today. No, no, no. Yeah, it's on me today. Next day. It's on me today. Coffee. Free coffee. Now Gina loves Tammy. Tammy loves Gina. They have a friendship going on. They're friends. Turns out Casey has a daughter whose age is literally in between my two daughters' ages. Next thing you know, they're coming over to hang out with us. We're going over there. We're hanging out on their back porch. Girls are playing. We're talking, getting to know each other. All of a sudden, we're friends just because of coffee. So I'm like, all right, God, now I want to share the gospel with them. Help me. But I'm kind of like not sure how to do that. Well, one day, Casey comes over. It's a Saturday morning. And here's the deal. I don't know what your lifestyle is like. My lifestyle is a little bit busy. I don't do well with a pop-in on any day because here's the deal. I work from home, so you might think, oh, Ed's at home, but I'm probably working at home, so Saturday morning, I'm putting together a sermon, got to do the Lord's work, so I'm getting ready to do the Lord's work, do a sermon, Saturday morning, Casey pops over with his daughter, and my daughter see his daughter, and they bolt upstairs, and they're playing, Casey sits down, I'm like, all right, well, I guess I'm sitting with Casey right now, so we sit down, I'm like, all right, let's, you know, we're going to be chums, we talk, and, you know, like 25 minutes later, honestly, here's what I'm thinking, Casey, it's time to go. I have to do the Lord's work. I've got to go do that sermon. It's coming up tomorrow, and it'd be nice if you left now. That's what I was thinking. I'm not proud of it. I'm just telling you that's the truth. I'm thinking, it's time for you to go home. Casey, listen, I'll bring your daughter off later. Go, I need to work. That's what I was thinking. And I heard, and have you ever had one of these moments where you know the Spirit of God is speaking to you? I heard the Spirit of God say two things. Pay attention. I'm like, I, I, listen, a lot of times when I think I'm hearing the Spirit of God speak, I, I don't know that it's God. I think maybe it's just me because it sounds like me in my own head, but this did not sound like me. I'm thinking, pay attention. So I'm like, fine, paying attention again. I'm like, I'm dead on. I'm like, wide awake, adrenaline going on to Casey. And like, we start talking about cities. We start talking about New York City. I'm like, yeah, I've been in New York City. And we start talking about how my experience in New York City is, well, I've been to Athens, Greece. It's this huge city. I'm like, seriously, tell me about Athens. He's talking about Athens. He's like, beautiful city. I'm like, I've heard it's kind of like on a slope and the, oh, ocean, all that kind of stuff. He's like, oh yeah. He goes, the only problem with Athens is it's so easy to get lost there. I'm like, what do you mean? He goes, well, Gina has no sense of direction. I'm like, oh, okay, all right. He goes, I have a great sense of direction, but I can't read the signs. I'm like, well, what did you do? He goes, well, Gina read the signs and I have a great sense of direction. I went, whoa, 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 whoa. He goes, what? I said, Gina reads the signs. Are they in English? No, they're in Greek. Okay. Gina reads Greek. Is that right? Gina reads Greek. Really? I said, do you think she could help me? He says, Help you with what? I said, you know Easter, right? Yeah. Easter. Here's the deal. Easter. God loves us. 
We are sinners. We kind of separate ourselves from God and we choose all kinds of stuff apart from God. And that's called sin. And literally, so we're apart from God because God is holy. And listen, we're stuck that way. And that's and if we die, that's the way it's gonna be, apart from God. So God does something incredible. He sends his own son down. Doesn't send like a, a bird down. Doesn't send, you know, a ram down. He sends his own son down, him in the flesh, to, down, to pay for our sins, to die on a cross for us. And then the son of God, God in the flesh, rises from the dead and then calls us to be in a relationship with him because he took the penalty that we deserved so that we wouldn't have to. And if we simply give our lives to him as a result of that, we're reconciled to the Father. I said, do you understand that? He's like, I said, listen, do you know John 1.1? 1, 1? He's like, no. I said, John 1.1, 1, 1. in the beginning was the word, and the word was God, and the word was God. I said, and I have this friend named Calvin, and he doesn't believe it, but we're using the same Greek text. If she could just help me interpret this text, I could explain it to Calvin. Could she do that? He's like, I said, do you understand? He's like, what you're saying is all of Easter rides on Gina. I said, yes, <laughs> that's right. So we go over and we get Gina. I'm like, Gina, I explained the whole story to Gina. She's like, I'm like, can you, I, so I showed her just the Greek. I said, I need you to translate it. She's like, she's, she's calling her mom on the phone. They're talking it all Greek, high pitch, and they're going, ah, I'm thinking they're talking Pentecostal people or something. They're going, yeah, yeah. And she comes up, she goes, no, Ed, that's the only translation. That A is not there. It's, it's the same, it's exactly what you said. I'm like, <sighs> I'm like, who are you? Who are you? Listen could have missed the whole thing. I could have missed the whole thing, not paying attention. Could have missed the whole thing, not recognizing. And God, that's what faith really is about. Posture of humility, being persistent, and then looking for God. Do you trust that God is going to act? And watch for his working. And here's the thing. I don't care where you're at in this room. You might be struggling in your faith right now. You might be struggling in your posture situation. And you're like, maybe you've been that person like expecting God better answer your prayer or you're not gonna have faith in him. Or maybe you're that person who's just given up because the thing you've been praying for for a long time has not been answered the way you want it. And so you've, been, you've just decided, God, I just don't trust you now. Or maybe you've just had your head in the sand and you've been so caught up that you have stopped noticing what God is doing around you. I would say the answer for you and I to have the kind of faith that pleases the heart of God rests in the gospel. The same story that Casey and Gina need to embrace for their whole lives. That it's the gospel that God